Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Margaret Ann Takashewski, Director of the New Haven Museum, and we're pleased to present tonight's program, Uncovering Their History, African, African American, and Native American Burials in Hartford's Ancient Burying Ground, 1640 to 1815. The project was commissioned by the Ancient Burying Ground Association in Hartford. Tonight's talk is sponsored by Connecticut Explored, the magazine of Connecticut history as part of their 20th anniversary year celebration. Our program this evening is co-presented with the Friends of Grove Street Cemetery, with whom the museum often partners. I'd like to welcome Michael Moran, who serves as chair of the Friends and invite him to tell you a bit more about their organization. Thank you so much, Margaret Ann, and thank you, Khalil, and everybody at the New Haven Museum. Before a word about the Friends, I want to say how much personally I admire and appreciate the New Haven Museum. I'm a member personally, and I encourage everyone to support our local history museum. Uh, so I hope you'll do everything you can to support this great, good institution. Margaret Ann, thank you for all that all that you do in, in your team. I have the honor, as Margaret Ann uh, noted, as being chair of the Friends of the Grove Street Cemetery, and we and the Friends are delighted to partner with the New Haven Museum tonight. We have partnered with the New Haven Museum from our founding. This is our 25th anniversary year. And anniversaries can be times certainly to celebrate, but they also should be times to reckon. Our country will soon in 2026 celebrate its semi-quincentennial or sester centennial, depending on how you want to style it, 250 years. And it'll be an important time in the nation to celebrate, but also to reckon. And at Grove Street Cemetery, this is our Quas Quai Bicentennial year. Try and say that three times fast. The cemetery is 225 years old. The first burial of Martha Townsend took place on November 4th, 1797. So this is a good time for us in New Haven to reckon more fully and inclusively with the history of our cemetery. James Hillhouse and his fellow founders wanted the Grove Street Cemetery, the nation's first publicly chartered burial ground, to be a place that ongoing generations would encounter the stories of the past. It was and is an encyclopedia of our history. However, it's not been the case that all the stories have been known and centered and celebrated. And that is the work we are about tonight. We are particularly glad to join the New Haven Museum to present one of our state's leading historians and to learn about the inspirational and evocative work that she has done with colleagues with Hartford's Ancient Burial Ground. Kathy's leadership in higher education is unparalleled as a scholar, as a teacher, and it's so great that she's now leading Connecticut Explored as it celebrates its 20th anniversary. And so we and the friends hope that this will be a truly generative evening for all of us in New Haven, as we have so much work ourselves to do to reckon with our history, to know the stories of all the people buried in our ancient burial ground, the Upper Green, and to know the full story of our own new burying ground as the Grove Street Cemetery was first known in 1797. We and the Friends are committed to see this tonight as the beginning of a journey, the beginning of our work to discover more, learn better, and reckon more truly with our community's history. And we know that the New Haven Museum joins in that commitment, and we're very excited, Margaret Ann, for the partnership we'll have in the weeks and months and years ahead. Again, thank you so much, and Kathy, really excited for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I will also um, say that the museum and the friends are pleased to be able to present this program during September, which is Connecticut Freedom Trail Month. And our organizations are among more than 50, 150 sites on the trail. So we invite you to explore them throughout the year. And we'll put that website in the chat. Um, as I said prior, um, Uncovering Their History was a project commissioned by the Ancient Burying Ground Association in Hartford, and this award-winning project is serving as a pilot program to inspire other Connecticut burying ground and cemetery groups to uncover their stories 
of their earliest Black and Indigenous residents and honor the lives and deaths of people who have no other public marker of their time here. The project was led by our, our speaker this evening, Dr. Catherine Hermes, who is a historian, educator, author, and as Michael said, recently named publisher of Connecticut Explored Magazine. Dr. Hermes received her AB in history from the University of California, Irvine, an MA and MPhil in history at Yale University, a JD from Duke University School of Law, and a PhD in colonial American history from Yale. She is professor emerita at Central Connecticut State University in the history department where she taught courses on Anglo-American legal history, Native Americans of the Eastern Woodlands, and other courses on early America and served as department chair from 2012 to 2018. She's the co-author with Alexandra Maravel of several articles and book chapters on Native American history in New England and is the author of book chapters on Native legal history. Currently, she's participating in a National Park Service Battlefield Interpretation Grant with Chris Radio, studying people of color at the Reading Encampment during the Revolutionary War. And this summer, she became the new publisher and editor of Connecticut Explored Magazine. Welcome, Dr. Hermes. Thank you, it's such a pleasure to be here. And I'm excited about presenting this research. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so everyone can see uh, the PowerPoint. So I started this project in 2018 when the Ancient Burying Ground put out a call for proposals um, asking for a, a scholar who would look into how many people of color were buried in the Ancient Burying Ground and, um, and some things about them, and analyze some of their lives and um, explore the, the background that they came from. But my team and I had a somewhat expanded vision. And what we wanted to do was create, in a sense, a, a virtual uh, set of headstones, as it were, to memorialize the people we uncovered. Um, and so we completed the project in 2019. Our research has been public for several years now, but we continue to work on discovering things about the ancient burying ground. And we're looking into now women, all women in the ancient burying ground and anyone with connections to the West Indies. So those are two new projects. And I'll be talking a little bit about that new research tonight as well. Um, I know we've mentioned that uh, Connecticut Explored, of which I am now the publisher, taking over from Elizabeth Norman, who was its founder. Um, we've been talking about the Connecticut Explored collaborating with the Ancient Burying Ground. I want to say that I was not the publisher of Connecticut Explored when the ancient when um, Connecticut Explored picked the Ancient Burying Ground as a game changing project um, for its twentieth anniversary. And there are a number of other wonderful game changers who have been named. Um, I can't go through them all because there are 20 of them, but I encourage you to look at our fall issue, which has um, just been published and which we're sharing online. There's also a free newsletter you can get um, that will tell you about some of the stories in there. And you can see what some of the other game changers are doing. The Ancient Burying Grounds website has its new research and documents about its headstones and footstones that have recently been photographed. My website, AfricanNativeBurialCT.org, has the whole project on there, and I hope you will visit it. So the ancient burying ground in Hartford is a place that you may have passed by. Some of you may have been in it, but a lot of people walk by it and they don't even really know it's there. Um, there's a big bus stop in front of it. The center church is located in front of the burying ground. It's a busy intersection at Main Street and Pearl Street and Gold Street um, intersecting there. And it leads down to um, Bushnell Park. It's a, it's a lovely walk around there. 
but it's very easy to kind of forget that the that this ancient burying ground is there that dates from 1640. And this was the maybe not the first burying ground in Hartford. We believe that there was another burying ground on Kingsley Street that dated from a slightly earlier period. But this is the place where everyone who died in Hartford came to rest. And it did not matter what race, what ethnicity, what circumstances, rich, poor, male, female, black, white, native, all were buried together if they died in Hartford and didn't uh, arrange for a private burial. So for example, it was also possible that some individuals would be buried on private plots of land. When we started this project, we were told that there were about 300 people of color in the burying ground. And if you go to the burying ground now, you'll see that it looks like maybe three to 400 people period could be buried in there. That's because the graveyard was originally five or six acres, not the one and a quarter or one and a half acres that it is now. And now there are about, I think they've documented um, 429 headstones and maybe 175 footstones, something, I could be wrong on those numbers, but something like that, that are still extant in the, in the graveyard. And all of those belong to uh, white people. That doesn't mean that people of color didn't have stones in the past. Many stones and markers, whether they, or wooden markers, have disappeared over the centuries. Uncovering their history began with a database. We were determined to put every name we could find in, the, in a database that listed dates of death, how certain we were of the burial in the ancient burying ground. So was somebody, were we highly confident? Were we somewhat confident, slightly confident, or not confident? We wanted to have their names, demographic information, citation for sources, but we also wanted to have their connections to people and I'll, to other people and their communities. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Lastly, as the project was winding up, we realized that we needed to give faces to these people. And of course, this predates photography. Most of these people were not wealthy and could not afford to have their portraits painted or if their portraits were, were ever painted or drawn, they don't exist anymore. So we asked Cora Marshall, former chair of the art department at Central Connecticut State University, if we could use some of her paintings, um, Cora had done research into the runaway slave ads, as they were called, in the Connecticut Current. And she'd taken those ads and painted pictures of individuals. She also did historic paintings um, and things from her imagination, but also from other research that she did. And we use some of these to illustrate the people in the burying ground. I invite you to go to her website, coramarshallprints.com, where you can find her extraordinary artwork. I will always look at the face of the man that you see in front of you now and think of him as the enslaved man who became manumitted named Neptune, the sheriff, uh, the black sheriff appointed under a black governor in the late seven in the late eighteenth century. I want to begin by talking about native people in the ancient burying ground. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly how many native people might have been there. Native Americans in this area, accepted uh, a number of people into their families and tribes um, who were of mixed race. They may not have been um, 
identified as Indian. Sometimes they were identified as mulatto or musty. And so what I what we counted was whenever we would get a description of Indian or a term like squaw, which unfortunately was used, um, we, we designated that person as native. Um, but there are probably many more people with native ancestry who were in the burying ground. And you can see on the screen some of the ways in which their deaths were recorded. Child of Abigail, an Indian woman, aged three, died April 1st, 1795. This is one of the last native burials that we know of in the ancient burying ground. And we don't know who Abigail was. There's no surname or identification of any of her relatives. But perhaps more spectacularly is old Robin, who died in Hartford in March of 1757. He was also known as Dr. Robin, and he was the medicine man of the Wangunk in Middletown. It was said that Dr. Robin was able to cure the king's curse, which was scrofula, or a, a form of tuberculosis, I think. And, um, and Robin's family, um, his ancestors had also been known to have curative powers and had treated uh, the Wangunk uh, sick for generations. His daughter continued in that capacity. Um, we also have people like Lydia, a widow who was charged with night walking or carousing at night with several other servants in August of 1710. And she was found with another Native American man named Drusus and with a number of African American men. And something that was interesting to find out about this, all of these night walkers who were arrested on that evening in August in 1710 knew each other because the wives of the white men to whom these servants belonged were all related to one another. Okay. I wanna talk a little bit about one of the first native people to appear in the records of Hartford as a householder or somebody who was working and living in Hartford itself. When Hartford was founded uh, as, a, as an English settlement, 1637, simultaneously, a war began called the Pequot War. And I won't go into the history of the Pequot War, but it was an extremely deadly war that introduced many captive women and children into the population of Hartford because they became the servants of white people in the colony. Um, I don't know if Jaffet was Wangunk, the native people of that area who lived in the village of Suckyog, which, which became Hartford, or whether he was Pequot or perhaps even Mohegan or some other local tribe. Um, Jaffet appears in the records of Hartford in February of 1658 because he was listed among the rate payers. That year, he paid a property tax. He didn't appear again until after King Philip's War, when he was listed in the colonial court records as Mr. Lord's Indian, and he was charged with breaking and entering into Nathan Stanley's warehouse. The Hartford County Court punished him with a fine of 16 shillings, or the equivalent of about four bushels of wheat. Mr. Lord had to make the first payment and Jaff at the second. But one of the one of the interesting things about this is the way in which he's referred as Mr. Lord's Indian. Um, typically, Native people did not have the same status as enslaved Africans, even if they were captive, that is, even if they were servants 
uh, for a long period of time, sometimes even for their life. And after King Philip's War in particular, Christianized Indians were often referred to as our Indians by the colonists. So in part, this designation of Jaffet as Mr. Lord's Indian could mean that he was employed by Mr. Lord, owned by Mr. Lord as a, as a laborer, or that he was a Christianized Indian who also happened to work for Mr. Lord. One of the most extraordinary stories of my whole career um, was finding the sunk squaw, Sarah One Penny the Elder. And I first came across documents relating to her in 1997 when I joined the faculty of the history department at Central Connecticut State University. I didn't know then very much about her. She happened to be a native woman who left a will and an estate administration. And I transcribed that for the journal, the Connecticut History Review, uh, along with several other native estate administrations. But I want you to picture here a deathbed scene. Sarah One Penny the Elder is dying. Present are her sister, Hannah One Penny, Mary Whiting, the daughter of Colonel William Whiting, who's about 24 years old at this time, someone whom Sarah probably raised. There might be other people in the room, maybe even the Colonel himself. And Sarah One Penny the Elder dictates her will. So this is an incumbative will, an oral will. And someone wrote down her wishes. And what she said was that she wanted all of her land in the South Meadow of Hartford, so where there were still wigwams in 1713, she wanted all of her land to go to her grandson, Scipio. And Scipio's guardian was to be William Whiting. And that's really all we knew about Sarah One Penny back in 1999 when I published those wills and for many years thereafter. But as I began to tease out some of these estate administrations and follow up genealogically on the people who were related and declared as relatives in these wills, I realized something that Sarah One Penny the Elder was also the sunk squaw referred to in documents in Middletown. Her sons, Nanamarus, Sienna, and Cushoy, who became the sachem of the Wangunk, were present at her deathbed, perhaps at that moment with Mary Whiting, perhaps at a later or earlier moment, but they were there too. And she instructed them to sell some of her land in Middletown to pay for her funeral and to pay her debts. Because she was only referred to as the sunk squaw, people did not connect Sarah One Penny the Elder with the sunk squaw of Middletown. And so by doing the genealogical work, I figured out that she was this leader. So how did she become the servant of William Whiting? Well, after King Philip's War, a number of Wangunk who were not still living on the reservation, but perhaps had been somewhat renegade, uh, as it were, um, during the war, were brought into a camp at Chetucket where they were held captive for 10 years. And about the time that William Whiting was starting his household in Hartford, he got married, he started to have children. Sarah One Penny the Elder was released from that captivity. She sold some land in Windsor. She went to work for William Whiting as a requirement of her release. She 
appears on deeds in Wethersfield. Uh, her daughter appears on deeds in Durham. The one pennies also appear on deeds um, on some other deeds. She sold land in Windsor, as I mentioned. Sarah One Penny the Younger inherited from another native woman from Wethersfield called Sarah Hopewell. Sarah One Penny the Younger also left a will in 1727 in which she gave her land on the Wangunk Reservation to Scipio, whom she now called Scipio Two Shoes, bringing him into her family. Scipio Two Shoes wound up selling the land in the South Meadow of Hartford and moving to Newport, Rhode Island. Scipio had an African father and in Newport, Rhode Island, he passed as an African and was the most litigious man of color in early 18th century Newport. Um, the legacy, I believe, of Sarah One Penny the Elder is that she taught her grandson how to use the court system. And she taught many people around her how to use the court system so that they would be able to try to preserve their land. Most of the native wills I found, about 46 right now, um, have some connection to her or her family, the Whitings or the Wangunk um, in general. That's a very different kind of story from some of the people of African descent in Hartford's ancient burying ground, where we find a preponderance of people who have no name. And one of the most striking things to me about this uh, project was finding 125 people who were simply described as a Negro soldier or a Negro boy or simply a Negro with oftentimes their age listed and even what they died of and even to whom they, to what white master they belonged, um, but without a name when their names were clearly known. And it's distressing. Uh, you can see in the corner there a Negro woman. Her age was 102. Everyone had to have known who this woman was and what her name was, but it wasn't recorded in the Sextant's records. And so as I started doing this work, I started to realize that my preconceptions of Connecticut as abolitionist and as somewhat more um, friendly to blacks, as it were, um, in you know, than the South, was not true. Um, and as I began talking about what I was finding to groups, um, giving public talks, I've run into people who find that hard to grapple with. Um, we have a mythology in this state that somehow Connecticut's slavery was kinder and gentler. And I think, and I, I came to realize this is just, first of all, it's wrong to think of any enslavement as less evil than any other kind of enslavement or less horrendous. Um, what I learned is that the same kinds of punishments that were meted out in Southern courts were meted out in Hartford County courts or in state courts. Um, and I'll tell you a few of the, I'll tell you a few of the stories as we go on. But we found in the ancient burying ground about 500 people we think could be there We've listed all their names. We went through probate records, account books, um, Sexton's records, um, church records, Siemens protection certificates in the latter part of the 18th century uh, once the United States was formed. We went through census records. And 
newspapers. And so that's how we accumulated these many names of people who were otherwise obscure. You'll see here a monument erected in 1998 to the African American, to the African Americans, free people, slaves, and five black governors. This monument was the result of research done by students at Fox Middle School. And it's just a remarkable achievement about what citizen historians uh, can do. And they were able to call some of the names that are, um, and they have a, at the bottom of this headstone is a slab that has some of the names recorded there. But on our website, we have many, many more. So let's take a look at Norman Morrison and his um, network with Newport, Rhode Island, West Africa, Hartford, and even Bolton, uh, Connecticut. Norman Morrison was a doctor from Scotland who settled in Hartford in the 1730s. He could read and perhaps even speak about five languages. He was uh, a very prominent citizen. His landlot bordered Market Street where his grave now still is, um, although it's a little bit hard to find. It's next to Capitol Community College, embedded in a church. It's external, so you can see it from the street, but it's but you have to look um, pretty carefully. Anyway, Norman Morrison owned seven sixteenths of a couple of different schooners. And he sent his ship to West Africa where it came back with um, captives. And it, um, and on one voyage, the Speedwell, it dropped its cargo in New London and then went up to Middletown. Um, Norman Morrison, in his probate record, listed the names of the people on the last voyage. And I know this is probably a little bit hard to see on your home screens, but right here, I'm circling with my cursor, you can see the Bolton Farm. Um, all of those people were brought directly from West Africa in 1761 and placed on a farm in Bolton. And then Norman Morrison died of smallpox, as did his son, Alan. And his will dictated that all of these people would be sold. So we have no idea at this point what happened to them. You can see on the relationship tree that they still have their African names and they, did, they cer almost certainly did not speak any English. Um, and so you can imagine the shock and hardship that they encountered being placed in rural Connecticut in a landscape they couldn't recognize. Um, perhaps later their names were changed and that's or anglicized and that's why we've had trouble following up. Um, that, that voyage was unknown to scholars until we reported it to the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database because it was buried literally in that probate record. Um, Morrison had many other uh, lands. He had a dwelling house in Hartford, a farm in East Hartford, a home in Hartford, um, a, ho a farm in Plainfield, a farm in Heartland, a farm in Ellington, uh, a warehouse near the river in Hartford, and land in Hampshire County, Massachusetts. And I suspect that most of those places had enslaved people on them. One of his enslaved members of his household, we think is buried in the ancient burying ground, Tony, who also died in that same bout of smallpox that got Morrison and his son. A lot of the enslaved people in Hartford came 
not from West Africa, but from the sugar plantations or habitations in the Caribbean, and they were brought to farms in Connecticut. Or to households in Hartford. And we're going to take a look here at the Lord Woodbridge family. Um, the Lords were merchants. The Woodbridges tended to be ministers. Um, and in particular, Timothy Woodbridge, who was the minister of the first church in Hartford, now called the Center Church, um, was also president of Yale. And on a several, uh, I guess a couple of decades ago, some honor students did some research and published a website called Yale Slavery and Abolition. And quoting from a secondary source they found, they said, Timothy Woodbridge owned an Indian boy and some Negro slaves. Woodbridge's habit was to go to court and purchase the labor of either free Africans or free native people who had fallen into debt. And he would purchase their labor and then they would be indentured to him for a period of years. And so the Indian boy was actually a man named John Wobbin. Um, but as you can see from this relationship tree, the Lord and Woodbridge families owned many, many enslaved people. Most were not servants um, and did not have indentures. For example, when Richard Lord III died in 1711, he left many enslaved people to his widow, Abigail Lord. Abigail Lord then married Timothy Woodbridge and conjoined their households, both of which had enslaved people already living in them. One couple, Andrew and Tamar, um, I guess found some solace in one another. Maybe they fell in love. Um, but because they were enslaved, they were not permitted to marry. So they formed their own relationship and Tamar became pregnant. She and Andrew were whipped by the county court for fornication. Later on, they were permitted to marry and they had two more children. Andrew and Tamar and their son Daniel were then given as a wedding present to Elijah Lord, um, John Haynes Lord's father and Abigail's grandson, or and Abigail's son. Um, and that split them from their daughters, Lydia and Isabella. Lydia was then be bequeathed in Timothy Woodbridge's will to his daughter who lived in Massachusetts. And so the family was torn apart. And this is a story that we're familiar with on Southern plantations, um, but it's not a frequently told story in Hartford, but it happened frequently. And you'll see here, uh, Sally Cuff, and Dinah the Elder and Dinah the Younger. Um, and I'm gonna talk about them right now. Um, so Richard Lord III enslaved a couple, Coffee and Hannah, and they had a daughter, Sally. Sally was then bequeathed in um, Abigail Woodbridge's will to her grandson, John, Haynes Lord. So she went to live there. Um, Sally was baptized with a woman named Dinah in 1768. Dinah, by the way, now has a street named after her in West Hartford, thanks to the work of the Witness Stones project there in, and um, the community in, in West Hartford for trying to memorialize um, the two Dinas at that time, at the time that 
um, they died. They were in Hartford, but now that's part of West Hartford. All right, so Sally purchased her freedom from Richard, uh, from John Haynes Lord for a hundred pounds, which is an enormous amount of money. Um, it was probably three to five times her own value if she were to have been sold by um, Lord himself. John Haynes Lord was one of the wealthiest men in Connecticut. When he died, he had thousands of dollars in his estate. Um, but Sally purchased her freedom and went on to live as a free woman in Hartford. She purchased her freedom just two years before Connecticut enacted a gradual emancipation act. And, and Sally may not have been covered immediately under that act. So she was able through that purchase of her own life to live as a free woman. What's remarkable is that these generations of people went from the west coast of Africa into slavery, to captivity in the Caribbean, to life in Connecticut. Now they were baptized, right? Um, partly because they lived in the minister's household. Um, but what that meant to them, how, how much they knew about the Christian religion, we can't really say. Um, very soon after this, African Americans in Hartford would create a church that later became the Talcott Street Church, and that's another history for another day. But Christianity came to mean a lot to the individuals who were enslaved. Not all of the people in the burying ground of African descent um, were enslaved, but most began life that way. And so I'm going to tell you another story about a man who was able to manumit himself. They called him Mr. Gibson. Samuel Gibson was a grocer. He came to his trade in quite a roundabout way. First enslaved in the West Indies and purchased by the Frisbee family in Guilford, Connecticut, he bought his freedom and moved to Hartford and set up a store. As his store became popular, he began to advertise his wares in all of the major newspapers in New England. Um, and he became a well-liked, well-respected individual in the town. So much so, he's the only African-American person I've found in Hartford in this period, who had a full obituary, talking about his life, talking about his character. Um, and giving him the kind of tribute that probably so many more uh, really deserved. But Gibson was not only a businessman, he was somebody who could could read he read the bible he was able to play the fiddle um, one can imagine him in his vast community of people um, and yet when he died at the very young age of about 35 um, he left his entire estate to his former master's son that son had been his apprentice in the grocery store in Hartford. Um, and it's an interesting thing that um, I've uncovered, not the only one who's uncovered it, but that I've uncovered in my research with respect to many men of African descent who died as adults, unmarried adults in Connecticut they tended to leave their estates if they wrote a will. They tended to leave their estates to the children of their former masters. And, you know, it's, it's something to speculate about. 
is it that natal alienation, having no family of their own, having been separated from any family they might have known in their land of origin, you know, did they form familial bonds with their captors? Um, did the master put uh, pressure on the dying man to leave the estate back to the son? Um, it's, it's hard to know what happened. These were complicated relationships in which, um, you know, all kinds of psychological um, reasons for the bonds might, might exist. Um, lastly, I want to look at some of the new research that we've been doing. Um, and this involves, as I mentioned, people with West Indian connections and, um, and also women in the ancient burying ground. When we started the project on the people of color in the ancient burying ground, we found the name of a Mrs. Dewborn. And after I dabbled a little bit into who she might be, I realized that she was a white woman. And so she was left out of our database. But what was intriguing about her is that she came from San Domingo, meaning Haiti. And I always kept her in the back of my mind as somebody that I wanted to follow up on. So when the ancient burying ground commissioned me to look at women and people with connections to the West Indies, I, of course, immediately thought of her. And this is an important, uh, I think, an important connection. Connecticut sent lots of packets and sloops and schooners all over the Atlantic and to the Caribbean. And communities formed. So when the Haitian Revolution broke out in 1791, there were people in Connecticut to whom someone like Mrs. Dubois, as she really, uh, as her name really was, to, to which Madame Dubois could turn. There were also large populations of San Domingo planters in New York and in Philadelphia. Um, Madame Dubois seems to have come by herself. Um, her husband was dead. Her son was in France. I could not find any reference to servants or enslaved people who came with her. All of the references in her will were to enslaved people or servants who were actually back in San Domingue or in, in Haiti. Um, Madame Dubois was the owner of a habitation in Petit Guave, um, I'm probably saying this wrong, uh, near Port-au-Prince. And she fled in January of 1792 because of the revolution, although she'd, she'd managed to stay put for quite a long time. But her health was beginning to decline. So she wrote a will left a copy of it in a chest of drawers in Haiti, and then came to Hartford on a ship and stayed at the tavern of a man named John Avery, who ran a, who ran a tavern and ran an inn. Avery himself was a slaveholder. He had an enslaved man who wound up drowning uh, at about the time that, well, not long after, uh, Madame Dubois arrived. And um, in her will, Madame Dubois gave bequests to several men and women of African descent who inhabited her plantation, including the commander of the plantation, that is uh, one of the black leaders, um, enslaved, but probably an enslaved overseer um, or man of some status on the plantation. Uh, the second in command, and then several other women. She freed one woman named Flora and mentioned in her will that she wanted to free Flora's children, but she didn't know if the government in 
uh, Saint Domingue would allow her to do that. The bulk of her estate went to her minor son, but in 1793, when her son returned to the habitation, he freed all of the remaining enslaved people there. Now, this plantation in Saint-Domingue belonged to a French woman who wound up here because of a revolution. But remember the Lord family that I talked about earlier. Richard Lord and Samuel Willis, who later became governor of Connecticut, owned a plantation called the Cabbage Tree Plantation in Antigua. And it produced sugar and they eventually sold that plantation. But many people in Hartford had, and in Connecticut generally, had connections with the Caribbean, with Jamaica, with Barbados, with Antigua, um, early on with Providence Island, um, until that uh, disintegrated in, in 1641. Uh, that community, um, and later on with Haiti, which was the greatest sugar producing country on uh, in, in the Atlantic at the time. We're still trying to uncover how many people from Haiti might have arrived in Hartford or its environs. Um, there are the ship's manifests are difficult to come by, but I found a couple of others who settled in New London, um, and probably there are more. Um, I think that these are important, uh, important relationships. Madame Dubois, who was probably Roman Catholic, but possibly Huguenot, um, had a funeral. She had a funeral procession to the North Church She's buried in the ancient burying ground. Um, the North Church seems to have had abolitionist leanings later in time. And Madame du Dubois revealed in her will some leanings toward anti-slavery, even though she had a, a large number of enslaved people on her plantation. And I think some of this starts to mark a change in attitudes in Connecticut um, as these revolutions are taking place. But the upshot is the revolution in Haiti um, did not result in more freedom for Africans in the Americas, um, in, the, in North America. It probably created a situation where um, there was a bit of a crackdown. Um, Connecticut had already enacted its gradual emancipation law. So people continued to be freed in Connecticut with the last person being freed ultimately in 1848. Um, I'm gonna stop here because I wanna have plenty of time for questions. And I would also urge you to take our survey, um, we, which is gonna be put in the chat for you. Um, our survey is um, asking questions about tonight's program and your interest in the Ancient Burying Grounds um, project. We'd also like to offer you a free copy of the fall issue of Connecticut Explored, which you can get on our website. We give you one free introductory offer. When you take the survey, you'll be given a link to obtain that. And I really want to thank everybody for their kind attention. And now I'd like to, to take some questions. But I'm going to leave this last screen up here um, for a little bit and, and look at the chat. Thank you for a, a wonderful and, and deep, deep talk. We really, it, it, it's work that I think a lot of people um, look at and go, what are we going to learn from it? Um, and so listening to you talk about it and really focus on specifics and, and tell those stories, you really see the importance of the of the work that, that put into it. Um, from, you. from you're welcome. Uh, from my perspective, listening to the talk and and learning 
at, at, with everybody about it and, and more in depth about it. Um, for me, I don't think it would be very easy work to do. Um, there's a lot of uh, depressing facts, very sad stories mm -hmm. that you learn from. Um, so how do you kind of manage that for yourself and, and looking at some of the sadder stories um, and then how do you kind of bring that out in, in the work that you do to kind of talk about it? Yeah, it, you know, I'll tell you, it was, some of it is very sad. And um, in particular, I remember very clearly the day that uh, Tavia Jefferson and I, she was my research assistant, were looking at the Sexton's records and seeing just this long, long list of unnamed people. And these were the unpublished Sexton's records. So there are Sexton's records that are published in the Hartford um, catalog of the First Church, for example, but they left out most of these people. And just, and in particular, I think seeing, seeing the unnamed infants and the unnamed old people and just learning that you know, there were all these details that were there listed about them, and we could not know their names it was heartbreaking. Um, looking at the court records and seeing some of the punishments that were meted out um, to people who were behaving very innocently, like carousing uh, with night walking, or who were trying to form relationships and then were punished for fornication. Um, you really history is a hard subject it always is no matter no matter what you're looking at there are very few like truly celebratory um times in history maybe the coming down of the berlin wall things like that where you're really celebrating but um history's hard anyway but i never came across anything as hard as this project emotionally and and thinking about it um everybody thinks today We've got cell phones in our pockets, we're texting, we're emailing. There, there's all this digital content that's out there that's kind of dic um, uh, telling our lives, basically. Mm -hmm. So if someone were to take our phone today, 100 years from now, <laughs> we'd be able to gleam more insight than they would back then. But you're looking at the records from back then. So how do you make, as a historian and also as an educator, how do you make those leaps um and those um moves in in telling the story to fill in those gaps um without betraying maybe who the person actually was yeah i mean it's really tough when you have so when you have so few records um and maybe just snippets here and there um a lot of times what i do is i try to find scholarly work that so I'll give you an example. So the, the guy named Neptune that I talked about in the beginning, who was one of the elected black sheriffs, a ceremonial position um, in Hartford, he was a barber. And I know a lot about Neptune in one way. I know who he was married to, his wife Priscilla, and I know their children's names and that many of them are buried in the ancient burying ground. But I knew nothing about his personality and, you know, in the tales about him that are recorded in white histories like ye old time Hartford, believe it or not, um, you know, they talk about him as the terror of evildoers, that he's this guy who harshly punished Black people when they violated the law in his role as Black sheriff. Um, well, Neptune was a barber. And so I found some scholarly work on barbers and looked at their roles in communities. And from there, you can extrapolate that Neptune had a similar role. And then you look at little facts about his life, that he paid for the burial of an unnamed native woman who died in Hartford. That's an act of generosity and kindness, right? And so you begin to see that perhaps the portrait painted in the antiquarian histories was not the real Neptune. And I can't really tell you what he was like, 
um, but I can tell you these things about him and you can imagine. And that and that's about as close as we get. But I but you certainly try to stay faithful to what you know about people like him in the past so that you're not exaggerating his position or um, the kind of circumstances that he faced. Yeah, and and questions are starting to come in, so I'll, I'll hop into those in a second, but I just want to follow up on that. Is there is there ways when you do your work to kind of make sure that that idea of history changes as more facts get uncovered or as stories get uncovered when you when you publish your work or when you kind of present your work in a place like this um what kind of things do you do to kind of in addition to talking with me like we are right yeah. now yeah what do you do to kind of to invite the um not making history on a pedestal the idea that it's it's an ever-evolving uh craft and 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 discipline that kind of if it doesn't evolve it it causes other problems so how do you encourage that evolution of the story to kind of make sure that people continue to do the work and don't think what you've done you're done you don't have to do anymore yeah. well i i always like to point out the work of the middle school kids right they were not trained historians they had a teacher who <laughs> obviously knew how to do research and and guide them um but but nobody was a professional historian, PhD historian, right? Um, but look what they did. They uncovered stories about the black governors, a ceremonial position that existed in most New England states or you know, most New England colonies um, prior to the 19th century. They uncovered this information and made it public. And there were big articles in the Hartford Current about this. And that revolutionized our scholarship. Anne Farrow and her colleagues work on um, the role of the insurance industry in, um, in the slavery in Hartford that, that she published in the Hartford Current first and then in her book uh, on the log books is tremendous citizen historian work. Um, at the same time, scholars are also uncovering new things. And so you never stop learning new things as a historian. It's not, the past is done, but uncovering the past is not done and it never will be. Okay. Um, so I wanna jump into, we have some questions. Um, has there been any, has there been any thought um, or movement on the idea of looking at DNA to connect uh, people in the burying ground to their descendants? So, um, so I have to say, first of all, that um, for this project in particular, I want to point out no digging was no actual digging in the ground was done. And um, it's my understanding that Nick Bellantoni, the former uh, state archaeologist, um, was consulted some years ago about, um, you know, what might be in the, the burying ground. One thing I will say is, the so many bodies have been moved. Um, some were, unfortunately, um, if you read our report on the website, it'll tell you this, but some were taken to the river and dumped as buildings were added and uh, Main Street was expanded and whatnot. Um, some were reinterred. Um, some were taken to landfill. Um, so who's there, who's really there, and are they where they are supposed to be? We don't know. Um, so I think DNA could be tough. I don't know that anybody wants to exhume the remaining corpses there. <laughs> um, but it's not something on it's not something that I can deal with. I've done genealogical trees, and one thing I do want to point out is for every named person, we created an ancestry.com tree so that where we worked our way up as far as we could go in the time frame that we had, hoping that people would start with themselves and work their way down and maybe link up with us. And, um, and so we have those genealogy trees and we also have the relationship trees that show the community. And we may eventually be able to link up through research. <laughs> 
but it, it would be great if people could find their DNA and if, you know, but I, I don't know, the ancient burying ground would have to take that on. Uh, one of the other questions was, uh, since it was such a large area, um, do you know if if remains were removed before development or if, because we see that on the New Haven Green, where yeah. we still have some people there. Um, so the idea of there, do you know of anything? Yeah, so um, I do know that at certain periods of development in the 19th century, and again, I think in the 1950s, um, there were removals of skeletal remains um and and like i said some were taken to the river uh some were taken to landfill um probably a lot of probably a lot were just kind of covered over um and by then by even by the late 19th century when the graveyard was kind of redesigned to look neater and you know, the, they put the fencing around it and whatnot. Um, probably even then, most of the headstones had gone. If you think about five to 6,000 people being buried there, um, mostly there's not a marker, so you don't even really know, you know, where they are. Okay. Um, in doing this work, um, what is the, what perspective, sorry. What perspective does learning these hidden stories for Native and African Americans grant you in your everyday life? So how does how does the work that you find and the stories that you how does that change your perspective? Well, so in a number of a number of ways. Um, when I started working on the Native wills back in 1999, when I published that work, I became very interested in the families of these people. So I started doing genealogies. Um, most academic historians aren't trained in genealogy. The burying ground was just kind of this cataclysmic shift for me, doing more and more of that kind of work because I, I felt like it was so important to to explain the lives of these people, um, to make their lives known, to memorialize them on the one hand it, through the website, but also to try to understand a bigger picture that all these details were, were showing, um, to, to try to come to a truer history of Hartford and Connecticut in general. And, that's why I became the publisher of Connecticut Explored. Connecticut Explored has been doing that kind of work, you know, uncovering lots of little histories and stories and things about Connecticut that don't make it into textbooks and um, that aren't the usual stories. Elizabeth Norman, for example, published a, a children's book on Venture Smith, another great African-American in our state. Um, so Connecticut Explored was doing that kind of work and the Burying Ground Project made me realize I want it to be more a part of that. Um, I, I feel that these family and community stories are something that's lacking. And then I'll reveal something very personal here. Um, I am adopted and have, and up until a few years ago, had very little of my own personal history. And I feel that knowing your past is something many people are very privileged with, but many other people are not. And being able to recover that, to not feel natally alienated, as it were, is huge. So, um, so I want to do that as a historian and as a human being. I, I mean, I can't even imagine the emotional toll it takes to to tell the stories, but also deal with your own and kind of you know, go to work and deal with it and, and bring it back. So I, I thank you for sharing that. Um, another question from our from our uh, audience is, um, were you surprised by the record keeping that were kept by the colonists for people that were of African descent or native descent, um, given that they weren't held in such high regard in society, but they still kept those records? I mean, when I was in graduate school and I will just say right now, 
I wrote my dissertation mainly on Puritan guys <laughs> um, with one chapter on native people. But um, I, I was, it was kind of a truism that, you know, not to be crude, but every time a Puritan spit, he wrote down a record of it. Um, and that really seemed true for white people. I mean, we just had such extensive knowledge of the of the Puritans, not so much for women, but you know, um, white guys, lots of information. I started to realize in graduate school there was also a lot more about women than I anticipated, because once you get past um, kind of the sermons and the stuff that the clergy left, and you really get into court records and church records and things like that, town records. Well, then you really start to get the lives of ordinary people. And I always liked kind of history from below. Um, so, so I knew that records were out there for poor people and marginalized people until I really dug um, into the native people in this area, into the Wangunk. I didn't have any idea how many records I would find. Um, and so that was, in a way, it wasn't surprising because every time a Puritan spit, he wrote it down. But, and sometimes, um, you know, that Puritan was interacting with native people and with African people. Um, but yeah, the extent of it did surprise me a little. Um, I mean, we were always told that you couldn't really do the kind of community study African American history um, that you know might come later for the 20th century for the 17th and 18th. You couldn't find that stuff. But I found a will in 1695 left by Philip Moore and then one left by his wife Ruth that told a lot about their life on a farm in what is now East Hartford. Um, that probate record um, is, gives about as much information as any white person's probate record. And so it's just not true. You can't find anything. And, but it is harder to look. You have to look in places that many historians just didn't bother with, um, say prior to the 1980s. Okay. Um, kind of following up with that idea. Um, somebody said that there's a lot of really interesting information on your slides um, and and uh, not as easy to read if somebody's looking at yeah. it on their phone. No, no, um, for we, sure. We, we talked about that. Um, where can people um, see that work or, or see uh, representation of some of those slides? Is there somewhere you're going to post it or share it with people? How can people get that? So um, we did post um, some documents on the um, ancient on the site that I have for the ancient burying ground. It's African Native Burials CT.org. Um, and, and some of those documents you can reference there. Um, if somebody's interested in a um, well, uh, so I should say some of the native documents come from what was first called the Yale Indian Papers Project and is now the Native Northeast Portal. And our site references that website, so takes you to links that we used for, for our information. Um, newspaper databases are available at the Connecticut State Library. Um, and also through, some are through the Library of Congress through Chron Chronicling America. Um, and that's a free website. People Very can even find newspapers. Um, project um, and that's a free yeah um and uh, but i'm happy if somebody saw a document they'd like to see and i have a screenshot of it i'd be happy to send it they can and email I, me at publisher at ct dot at ct explore dot org and i put some of those contact links in the chat for anybody Good. that's following along um and finally we're going to end with the question of um, when you did this work, um, 
surely it wasn't by yourself. Nope. <laughs> um, oh no. So, so who who did help you um, kind of get access and then uh, um, then actually do the some of the research with you? So um, the primary research assistant was Tavi Jefferson. I I owe her a great deal. Um, she was one of my undergraduate students and now an alum of CCSU and um, also several graduate students that worked with me and they're listed on the web website. Um, Stephen Arell, who's a teacher and looking uh, looking forward to getting his own PhD. Um, Gabe Benjamin, who works at the Institute for American Indian Studies now. Um, Allison Golem, um, Chelsea Echevarria, who works for Connecticut Landmarks. Um, Sharon Clapp, who works at Central Connecticut State in the library. Um, and Alexandra Maribel, who um, I'm proudly proud to say is my wife, but also is a professor of history at Central Connecticut State. Um, and we all we all worked on the website together. Uh, of course, Cora Marshall contributing the art. Um, but I owe a great deal to the Connecticut State Library. Uh, we would never have been able to do this project without their assistance. Um, and Mystic Seaport um, also provided some of the research that I use and the Newport Historical Society, um, where I found a lot of documentation about Norman Morrison. Um, and the Hartford Public Library, oh, I have to get this in. So for the town records, we went to the Hartford Public Library, the Hartford History Center. Um, I think that kind of everybody else in the chat or in the Q&A is saying thank you and they're interested. It's very interesting and they're very happy with it. So um, I think we're going to, I think that kind of wraps it up for us. Um, I put a lot of the links in, in the chat. So anybody that's following along can see those there. Um, the recording of this, somebody asked to, is on Facebook and will remain there. There will be one on YouTube in a few weeks. Um, and uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, very interesting. And thank you to Michael as well for joining us and, and Margaret, of course, for, for helping with this um, and being a great director at our museum. Um, Kathy, is there anything you want to end with? I, I just want to thank everybody for their attention and for the great questions. And, you know, Please, if you go to the website and you have questions or thoughts or new information, um, we got some new information recently from the Pequot Library, um, please share it. Um, I would love to hear from you, publisher at ctexplore.org. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Happy that you joined us for another virtual presentation. Um, we have one more coming up in September. Uh, it's in two weeks, Thursday, September 29th at 6 p.m. Uh, New Haven Coliseum, where the boomers roam. So talking about the New Haven Coliseum and its impact on the city and the people there. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Good night.